a small number of police agencies and some minor use through other government agencies. Um, but it was beginning to see an increase in use in, this, in a small number of businesses in the private sector. During the 1930s, most of the media accounts were still full of praise for the polygraph, with very little criticism and attention being devoted to its level of accuracy or reliability. This despite the fact that the developers and proponents of the device were all members of the academic world. Concerns on its effects to rights to privacy and the right to not self-incriminate arose very rarely. Um, as the 1940s began, so did the polygraph's growing amount of public publicity and media coverage. Though the majority of the number, numbers released on how successful the machines were coming from the polygraph industry itself, the accuracy of the device was still rarely challenged. One of the reasons for this was its continued rejection of polygraphs in the court system. With all of the major names in the field either shifting their attention away from or dying, uh, combined with the court's rejection of its results, the polygraph may have been expected to continue to fall out of favor. However, as the middle of the 1940s marched into the 1950s, use of the device by businesses and governments would soon substantially increase as the paranoia over the Cold War and McCarthyism spread. Now, as we all know, the middle and late 1950s was a time of great distrust and false accusations. This environment would bring a sharp increase in use of the polygraph, especially by the federal government and then slowly spreading to other levels of government. That in turn led to more media attention of the instrument and a small but growing number of critical articles began to question the fundamental principles behind the polygraph itself. The days of its complete uncritical acceptance were passing. As demand grew, so did the number of private polygraph firms. Uh, and most of the numbers generally cited as proof of the instrument's accuracy were still industry generated. During this time, we also saw the emergence of challenges being issued to submit to the machine. For the first time, attention was being paid to the use of the polygraph for intimidation and political, political ends rather than as a deception detecting means. Through the 1960s, the use of the polygraph would continue to spread, especially in the federal government and private sector. Both its usage and complaints of its use began to increase as the extent, to the extent that Congress became involved by holding hearings, issuing reports, and making recommendations on the polygraph. Individual states began to limit the use of the instrument and to license operators. As in the past, though, courts continued to reject results as evidence, uh, and business use began to dramatically increase uh, especially in the pre-employment uh, testing of job applicants, as this group of people were not unionized and had no protection against it whatsoever. A greater portion of attention was becoming critical as opponents began to point out the glaring faults and deficiencies of the instrument, and the fact that the rapid increase in use had been based on little more than claims of the polygraph industry itself. Many articles during this period were definitely in favor of the machine, but even those writers felt compelled to at least mention some of the faults and some of the criticisms. Although the government continued to use the instrument, the 1970s saw media interest mainly focused on business use of the device, as employee polygraph screening, screening became a multi-million dollar industry. The attraction of the polygraph for businesses seemed to be its relatively low cost uh, and quick speed in comparison with traditional investigation of job applicants. Legal activity continued as more states took action and the federal government threatened but failed to enact any legislation. During the early 1980s, court use of the polygraph began to see some minor gains, despite the fact that criticism against it had dramatically increased. In addition to being widely reported that polygraph results were being used by prosecutors in determining who to prosecute and in plea bargains, in a number of jurisdictions, rape charges would not even begin to be investigated until the victim had submitted to and passed a polygraph exam. Federal use of the polygraph increased during the 1980s, drawing a great deal of media coverage, most of it highly critical. It took until 1988 until use of the polygraph in most business applications was curtailed by federal law. 
even though criticism and of the accuracy and validity had been building for years. One may have expected that the polygraph would begin to fade away with the passing of the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, um, all but abolishing the private sector's ability to use it, but it didn't. Uh, government continued to use the device through the 1990s, and in 1998, a Supreme Court ruling left it up to individual jurisdictions whether polygraph results could be submitted as evidence in a court case if both parties agreed to its use and at the judge's discretion. But it was really the unfortunate tragedy of uh, September 11th that would really breathe new life into the continued use of the polygraph. Um, last year, uh, as a group, the Neuro Numerous group built a sleep lab, uh, and we built it from scratch. Uh, for the project this year, it was decided that building and designing schematics from scratch is just a lot of work, uh, and we wanted to do what we could do to avoid doing it again. Um, so after some quality time with Google, a keyboard, and some coffee, um, Rain came across a project out of Cornell University um, by Jordan Crittenden and Edward Lai. Um, there is a URL, you just can't see it, sorry. <laughs> um, so it was, was decided that this would be a good opportunity to use as a starting point for our project, uh, since they built theirs for less than $50, uh, and that fit our budget of paperclip pretty well. Jordan Edwin's design measured pulse rate, galvanic skin response, or GSR, breathing rate, and stress of the, the individual's voice. Uh, ours was built mostly from their schematics, although an existing piece of hardware generously provided by Seth Hardy was used for reading pulse rate. Uh, and we also didn't measure um, voice stress level. We also ended up using a slightly different method to record breathing rate. Uh, the Cornell design initially used a thermistor mounted on a dust mask, uh, which we also included in our initial build out. Uh, which psychedelic, psychedelic Bike did. Uh, however, we decided to add our own touch. Um, another member, Ole Grover, designed a breathing band um, that works pretty much like the commercial machines do by going around your chest. Um, at the core is a simple slide potentiometer, uh, which is probably the most single most expensive part of the device. Uh, the rest is simply a plastic box, a spiral uh, phone cable, phone jack, an elastic band, and ribbon with cable with straps to, to help hold it around the chest, and of course, to make it China compliant, hot glue. Um, you can't really see the, the at the bottom of this, the slide is where the, the phone cable plugs in. Um, initially, the band itself was designed with uh, an elastic band all the way around the chest, but there was a tendency for that to bind uh, and it didn't really have the tension to properly pull um, on the slider for the pot potentiometer. After some experimentation, you see the result on the screen there. It's just ribbon and elastic band. Um, the spiral phone cord was used, again, because it's cheap, um, but it was also thought that it would helpful, be helpful for people moving around uh, just to get the stretch out of the cable, which was dead bang on. We also decided that instead of laying out all of the components on a single board like the Cornell guys did, it would be sleeker to have a box like you see. Um, it was a pain in the ass. What we didn't think about was that opening and closing the box all the time would cause movement on the wires, causing signal crossover, which gave us some really odd results at times. Um, so if you do end up building one, uh, don't use a box. It's just, it'll be easier for you. Um, after getting it built and tested, um, if you see at the bottom there, that microcontroller is an Atmel controller. It, it is labeled, but you can't see the label, unfortunately. Um, after we built it, we found that Jordan and Edwin recommended not to power the machine from a wall and to use a battery to power it. Uh, it was something about safety. Um, even after figuring this out, after reading it, we totally ignored it. Um, if you do decide to build one, please read their webpage just so that you understand the safety concerns that they had in powering it from the wall. Uh, the software that we, the Cornell team used was written in MATLAB. Uh, although another numer neuro numerous member, Christian Gruber, wrote ours in Java because that's what he knows. Uh, it also allowed him to develop on his Mac and easily deploy it to our Ubuntu box that we used. Um, while it is possible to run the software on a Mac, because data is sent over a serial port, 
uh, you'll need to use a USB to serial adapter uh, running at 38.4. Um, some of the cheaper ones don't do that speed, so just be careful if you do end up buying one, which, what you buy. Um, if you're doing this on Windows, the software wasn't designed for Windows, so it, at your own peril. Uh, the user interface was built using JCC Kit and Java Builder Swing. Um, overall, the software can be built with the Apache Maven project. Uh, we were using version 2.2.1, uh, although any version higher should work. Uh, with as long with as well as Java 1.6, um, the source code is available as you see uh, at code.google.com/p/neuronumerous. Uh, it's built using the Mercurial source control system, uh, and all of our software is open source. Uh, once this was built, running, and collecting data, we were quickly running out of time. Uh, our cry for lab rats was thankfully answered by 16 people, including myself, through mid-July of this year. Uh, giving Psychedelic Bike, the gentleman who built the machine, uh, about one week to go over data that was written out by hand by rain. So now you've seen our beautiful ghetto polygraph, you know, uh, very beautiful. Um, so uh, when we took special care to try and make sure um, that our testing environment would be as close to the polygraph industry standards as possible, right? Because, you know, we, we totally wanted to be able to. Uh, have data that would be comparable. Um, we tried to keep the environment quiet with few distractions. We limited the amount of people allowed in the room during the time uh, the examination took place, so that was a variable that wouldn't uh, interfere. Uh, standards dictate that the room temperature should be between 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans we had in the room. Uh, that works out to 21 to 24 degrees Celsius for the rest of the world. Um, Unfortunately, at the time we were doing testing, the city that we both live in was in the midst of a heat wave. So if you remember that we told you that galvanic is a, a variable that works on sweat. So we, um, we did try to make sure we didn't take any polygraph testing during the worst of it. But it'd be disingenuous, well, it would definitely feel disingenuous to me if I didn't tell you that during the worst of the heat wave, there were times that uh, our testing environment could be up to three degrees hotter than what was recommended by the industry. But I, we didn't see any major change between the times that it was hotter and what it wasn't. Um, but I did want to tell you that, just so, you know, uh, full disclaimer. Now, because the standard polygraph actually takes up to three hours to complete, uh, we kept it really simple by instead going with a uh, common pretest by polygraph examiners known as the numbers test. So how the numbers test works is that you're asked to lie to the examiner about a number. Um, so the polygraph examiner gives you a piece of paper and a pen. And he says, I want you to write down a number that's in between these three numbers. Pick four, five, or six. And so you write your chosen number down on the piece of paper. And the polygraph examiner can see what you've written down. It's no secret uh, to what you've written down. So after you've written your number down, you're hooked up to the machine. They let you get comfortable. And then the examiner uh, will, uh, th so the examiner tells you, I want you to answer no to every question I ask. So of course the examiner will say, did you write down the number one? And then of course you're supposed to say no. So the examiner will say no. About 25 seconds later, the examinee will ask, did you write the number two? And of course, you say no. So, so on and so on and so on until the examiner progresses up to seven. So if you remember, you wrote down four, five, or six, which is actually quite close to seven as a variable for where he's looking. So this is supposed to give an idea of what the data would look like if the examinee was telling the truth compared to what your data looks like if the examinee is lying. So neuronumerous came to the agreement that we would run our own version of the numbers test to collect data. Uh, we just decided that what would make most sense for our purpose is that uh, we do two tests. We, did one, we would do one as a control group of what the polygraph data looks like if you just ran the numbers test, right, on someone. And the second we would see what happened is if we ran countermeasures against the machine. Uh, so the person who's playing the part of the examiner in our homebrew test who was me, because I actually ended up losing a game of rock, paper, scissors, lizard, spocked, urban monkey, 
Yeah, I was freaking paper disproving Spock. But anyway, uh, before the te first test started,